All right, so today, today what we're going to pick up on is what's known as cell signaling. So photosynthesis is complete. I'm sorry? Photosynthesis is complete. Photosynthesis is complete. New lecture, call it cell signaling. And this is a cell's ability to respond and to communicate among stimuli. So we want to be able to communicate and we want to be able to respond to signal. So the picture that you're looking at here, just to give you some orientation, here's our cell membrane. In that cell membrane, we have a thing called a receptor. Typically, it's a protein. Then we have some sort of material that is going to be able to bind to that receptor. We typically call it a ligand. That ligand binds to the receptor. And then the receptor response, because what happens when we bind a protein to something? Remember, you bind the protein, you change that protein shape, and you change that protein's function. So when I bind that receptor to this light and it changes its shape, it changes its function, and usually what happens is you have a bunch of cellular biology and molecular biology that happens that results in a change in that cell's physiology. Okay? And that's the basic kind of rundown of cell communication and, and cell signal. So I want to define first the players. What types of things are involved in this process of cell signaling? Obviously, we're going to have the cell. And all cells, regardless of organism, regardless of type of cell, all cells have the ability to respond and communicate. They can respond to their surroundings, and they can communicate with other cells. What facilitates this communication is the receptor. And we typically are going to refer to them as cell surface receptors. And that cell surface receptor just simply is because it's on the surface of the cell or in the membrane of the cell. We're going to have signaling factors. that will act as stimuli. So it might be a hormone, and we might increase insulin that interacts with the insulin receptor to cause a change in the physiology of the skeletal muscle cell or the liver cell. Or it might be a neurotransmitter like acetylcholine, where we have acetylcholine that's released, interacts with the acetylcholine receptor, which acts like a sodium channel to allow sodium to cross into the muscle cell. Uh, or it could be an external factor. It could be some sort of particle, uh, some sort of chemical that has aroma attached to it. And then it binds up to receptors in the nose to send a nervous impulse into the brain and be interpreted as some sort of smell. Now, the interaction between the receptor and the signaling factor is going to lead towards changes in the cell, a change in cell physiology. And really, to get from the receptor to that change, there's a bunch of steps in between. There's a bunch of chemical things that have to happen in the cell. And we're going to call those signal transduction pathways. And we typically use transduction pathways or, or pathways in general to describe many of the different physiological events inside of the cell. We've discussed things like glycolysis, which is a pathway, Krebs cycle, which is a cyclical pathway, electron transport chain, which is a protonaceous pathway. So the single transduction pathway, again, is just simply the model that we use to try to understand these really complex things that are happening inside of the cell. So we're going to try to hit on each of these and begin to really flesh out the details of how each of these things works and how they uh, interact 
in the cell to accomplish the ability for the cell to respond and to communicate. So when we have a signaling event, it takes on or can be modeled in a specific structure. And this is just a pragmatic way for us to kind of keep track of each individual event and where it leads to towards the change in physiology. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to have this interaction between our ligand and our receptor. We're going to just simply refer to this part of the structure as reception. Now, reception can come in two different forms. It can come through detection, which is typically a detection of some sort of change in the external environment. And when I say the external environment, I'm referencing back to the cell, so it's the cell's external environment. So it's not necessarily what's up here around us, it could be, but it could simply just be a change in the extracellular fluid. So we have the presence of some molecule in the extracellular fluid that begins to interact with the receptor on, on those cells. And so we have that detection that occurs. The second thing that we need to know about here is what actually is being detected. And we're going to typically call it a ligand. So just think that a ligand is something that binds the receptor. So a ligand is going to be a chemical signal molecule that binds the receptor. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the only way that cells can respond is if they find some sort of chemical signal. You're actually going to find out that we can change a response in a cell through a change in voltage, through a change in other stimuli such as light, or through uh, interactions, some uh, sort of sensory input. You can brush your hand against the feather and you pick up that change in the environment that converts that mechanical perturbation into a chemical signal. So the ligand is just going to be a chemical signaling molecule that binds the receptor, uh, but the starting product can also be other factors. It can be voltage, or it can be a change in uh, mechanical perturbation, things like that. Once we've had reception, once we've detected that environmental change through the increase of a ligand or increase of voltage or increase of uh, light, whatever the stimuli is, we're going to have transduction. So transduction is going to occur. In transduction, our ligand or our stimuli causes a conformational change or switch upon binding to the receptor. And I've used the example of a baseball glove, right? Baseball glove has to be open in order to catch a ball. But as soon as the ball makes contact with the mitt, the glove has to change its shape to hold the ball. Okay? So the receptor has to be open to bind the ligand, and then once the ligand is bound, it closes or it changes its shape, and that leads towards some downstream interactions that occur. So then we begin to move the signal or transduce the signal forward. With transduction, leading from the conformational switch of the receptor, we usually initiate a series of reactions So we have reactions that occur in a pathway of molecules and enzymes. And hopefully by this point you're beginning to become familiar with pathways of molecules or enzymes. So you begin to go through 
and such restoration for patient closeness. So now I'm beginning to have certain substrates that are accumulating in the cell, certain products that are passed to new reactions as we progress through this pathway. And eventually, we're going to have a response. So we have reception leading to transduction, which leads to the response. And the response is just simply going to be the physiological action that occurs. And that physiological action can come in a variety of different, uh, of different responses. We could have a protein or an enzyme that has a functional change. So we can upregulate or downregulate the function of a protein or an enzyme. Uh, we may interact with the DNA and change gene expression. So gene expression is up or down regulated. So now we might begin to accumulate some new genetic product or we might reduce the production of the genetic product. We might have a metabolic event that's activated or inhibited. And all of these things can lead towards change in how the cell operates. Okay, so that's the basic kind of structure that we need to hang the rest of cell signaling off of. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now is sort of begin to outline the types of communication. As you are well aware by now, biologists love to categorize things and we've as we've observed cells doing different activities, we identify different types of communications, uh, or different forms of communication, or you might even put in signaling here. So different forms of cell signaling. The first type is a type called direct cell contact signaling. Direct cell contact signal. So you basically have two different cells, one of them that holds the ligand, and the other one that holds that surface receptor, and they make contact. That signaling molecule makes direct contact from the other cell to the cell containing the receptor. You have a, a, um, a source cell and then a target cell in this reaction. So we might have situations where the signal goes across the gap junction. So even more defined than having the cell-to-cell the -cell interaction between the signaling molecule and the receptor, you might have two cells that share that gap junction. Like two cells, and they have the gap junction, which is basically an open space between the two. And we have some sort of change here that begins to move across into the other cell. If it's in plants, so this would be animal cells. If it's in plants, The direct signaling, the direct cell to cell signaling can occur through the plasma desmata. This, what I'm showing here, this type of direct cell contact is called cell cell recognition. And 
cell cell recognition, we have the two cells that interact. One cell has the ligand bound in the membrane, one cell has the receptor. They come close together and have an interaction. Okay, so that's a direct cell contact or direct cell to cell signal both through gap junctions and plasma desmata, and what I drew here, and then also this cell-cell recognition method. The second type of cell signaling is called indirect cell signaling. And there are several types of indirect cell signaling, and you should recognize a few of these. So this is going to be no direct contact between the cells. So we're either going to have um, the contact or the signaling method either through the extracellular fluid or through the blood itself. The first type of indirect cell signaling is called paracrine signaling, which you can see occurring here, where I have one cell that releases molecules and surrounding target cells that are, are relatively nearby, so like same tissue, same region, that pick up the signal. So paracrine, we release a ligand from one cell and it moves through the neighboring extracellular fluid to interact with the nearby cells that express the correct receptor. So that's paracrine. Uh, the next is autocrine. And autocrine signaling, just like the auto uh, suggests here, the ligand is generated in a cell that feeds back onto a receptor bound in the same cell, in the membrane of the same cell. So this looks a little bit more like this, where I have my cell, the receptor in that cell, and I have some sort of molecule that's released and comes back it interacts on the same exact cell. And I think it's caused a physiological change in that cell. Endocrine signaling is a next type of indirect cell signaling. Uh, on this figure here, you can see that it's called long distance or hormonal signaling or endocrine signaling. The endocrine signaling, this is basically the whole purpose of the endocrine system that we have in many different organisms where we release hormones that act as ligands, they interact with distant tissues to cause those tissues to change or distant cells to change. So in endocrine system signaling, we have a ligand that we call specifically a hormone that's released from a cell and enters the bloodstream. Then in the bloodstream, that uh, endocrine hormone travel, travels absolutely everywhere throughout the blood and gets distributed uh, in all different corners of the organism, but only certain cells are going to be able to respond because they have the right receptor. So interact with the receptor of a remote cell. That remote cell, um, really the cell that responds is always going to be called the target cell. So that remote cell here would just be simply referred to the target cell. Now there is a second special form of paracrine that I like to sort of highlight out. And it's called synaptic <laughs> cell signaling. And the synapse is simply a gap that exists between two cells, and we release the ligand 
into that gap, and then we have interaction with the second cell across that gap. So it's a paracrine signaling system because we're basically moving through the exercise of the fluid, but we're going to a very specific location. So we're not just inundating the surrounding tissue, we're, we're very specific on where that ligand is being released. This is the way that the nervous system is going to interact in, in most organisms uh, with other cells and other cell types is through this synaptic cell signaling. So again, similar to paracrine signal. So I've given you a bunch of generalities. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to give you three examples of specific types of signaling. Uh, and basically, once we have the interaction, regardless if it's a paracrine signaling system or an endocrine or autocrine, once we have interaction between the ligand and the receptor, what happens inside of this? You've all heard me say before that I'm a molecular endocrinologist. This is what we look at. We want to know once the hormone binds a receptor, what are the molecular events that happen inside of the cell? So what are the pathways that are all involved? And I'm going to give you three different types of pathways. Just to give you kind of a look ahead, we're going to be the phosphorylation cascade, the cyclic AMP second messenger system, and then calcium second messenger systems. So we'll start out with the phosphorylation cascade. So each of these pictures, you're going to see a membrane. You're going to see the receptor. You're going to see our ligand, or what we're calling sigma molecule here. And then you're going to see the pathway. And at the very end of that pathway, we're going to have something that says cellular response, metabolic change, physiological change. This is just the indication that this transduction pathway is leading towards the response. How do we need to respond to this signal? And once we get through each of these three kind of more specific yet still general signaling systems, then maybe we'll talk about one. Maybe we'll pick um, insulin. And I'll just kind of fly by the seat of my pants and say a little bit about insulin signal. So signaling systems start out here first with the phosphorylation cascade. So first of all, what is a phosphorylation? This is where you get to interact. What does it mean to phosphorylate something? We've seen this before already. Where have we seen molecules being phosphorylated? Where in glycolysis? In the investment phase of glycolysis? In what step? What's that? Okay. Um, yeah, we saw it there because we saw what molecule being phosphorylated. We saw ADP being phosphorylated to form ATP. Glycolysis starts with glucose, and the first step is to take glucose and convert it into. Anyone remember what the substrate was? I've gotten there yet for studying. Does it happen to be glucose 6 phosphate? And what does that mean? We've taken the sixth carbon of the glucose molecule and we phosphorylated it. So we've added on an inorganic phosphate. We took that inorganic phosphate from the ATP and we popped it onto the glucose molecule. So, what is a phosphorylation reaction? What should we expect to see happen?
I'm all right with awkward silence. <laughs> this is where the rubber meets the road. Come on, let's think about it. What happened in the example of glucose to glucose 6 phosphate? I'm basically asking you to be less, less to be to, to, to be a lot more simpler than you're trying to be. This is not a rocket science question. Something's being added. Okay, something's being added. What's being added? Let's get down to the dumb level here. <laughs> ATP is being used to produce what's going to be added. What is actually being added? Phosphorylates. <laughs> Phosphate. We're taking ATP and we're converting it into ADP and inorganic phosphate because we want to use that phosphate to phosphorylate something, to put the phosphate onto something. You're making this all way too complicated. You're thinking like, okay, what are the what are the words that are involved in glycolysis? <laughs> So a phosphorylation reaction does what? It adds a phosphate. So if I'm going to tell you about a phosphorylation cascade, what should you expect to see happening in a phosphorylation cascade? OK, I'm going to expect to see some phosphates being added. Typically, what type of enzyme phosphorylates? Does anyone remember the name? Anyone know the first name of the enzyme, the first enzyme's name in glycolysis? Hexokinase. So what type of, so the hexo refers to the fact that it's a six carbon sugar. So forget about the hexo, what kind of enzyme phosphorylates? A kinase. All right, now we're making some progress. So in my phosphorylation cascade, what type of enzyme should we see? Kinases, and how many of them? It's a cascade, so probably multiple kinases. You guys have just built the phosphorylation cascade, and you're basically going to take individual kinases, and they're going to become active to phosphorylate the next kinase, to phosphorylate the next kinase, to phosphorylate the protein to cause the cellular response. So, your phosphorylation cascade starts out with the signal molecule or the ligand binding to the receptor. When that signal molecule binds to the receptor, what happens to the receptor? Basically, I'm asking what happens to a protein when you bind that with a protein to something? Okay, change the shape, change the function. When that receptor is not bound, its function is to not activate a relay molecule. When that protein is bound, its function probably is to activate the relay molecule. And the relay molecule is going to be a molecule that basically takes the information from the membrane and brings it into the cytosol to turn on this thing called the phosphorylation cascade. You know, you have a question. This is a yeah, this is the, the physiology and the molecular biology of generating a signal. So, these lights can act as a signal, right? So, when the receptor binds that ligand, it's equivalent to the, the mod they say, hey, Dr. Bowen, turn the lights on. That's the signal. Now, what needs to happen for the lights to be turned on? I have to go over to the light switch and I have to turn it on. Okay? So, the signal molecule binds to the receptor and says, hey, it's time to turn on a phosphorylation cascade. And so the receptor is going to change its shape, changing its function. Going from the same silver rock to the example of the gray light on. Where now it's going to activate a relay molecule. And that relay molecule is sort of like the switch that turns on the phosphorylation cascade. So I have this thing called inactive protein kinase 1. 
it's called an inactive protein kinase one because this is a very general response. If we were looking at a more specific response, it would actually have a name. There are systems um, that are centered around uh, mitogen activity called mitogen activity uh, protein kinases. We call them MAP kinases. So one of these could be MAP kinase if we we're going to be more specific to this particular possible relation cascade called the MAP kinase pathway. All right. So this general pathway, we start out, we have an inactive protein kinase. If it's inactive, what does that mean? The protein's not doing anything. When that protein gets activated, it changes its shape, changes its function, goes from being inactive function to active function. Now that it's active, it's a kinase, so what does it do? What does a kinase always do? Kinase. K-I-N-A-S-E. Base, we know it's an enzyme. Kind, we know it. I'm going to give you a cheat sheet here. Kinase is always do what? Phosphorylate. Always phosphorylate. And they are enzymes. Okay. So my inactive protein kinase 1 becomes an active protein kinase 1. Inactive means it's not phosphorylating. Active means it's phosphorylating. What's it going to phosphorylate? Well, it's going to phosphorylate another protein kinase because it's a, kin it's a phosphorylation cascade. So protein kinase 2 in its inactive form, in the presence of an active kinase 1 and ATP, to get the phosphate is going to become active by being phosphorylated. All right. So whenever we pop a phosphate onto something like a protein kinase, it causes that protein kinase to become active. So the cascade is inactive to active, inactive to active because we're using ATP, inactive to active for this third protein kinase because the second protein kinase uh, phosphorylates the third protein kinase, turning on a protein kinase by adding a phosphate. And then the end of the cascade is for some inactive protein. This is not a kinase now, but it's a, another protein that is going to be converted into an active form because I phosphorylated it, because I burned an ATP and my active protein kinase 3 was phosphorylated, leading towards some sort of cellular change. Okay? Specific example called a phosphorylation cascade, but it's really general because it's not showing the specific type of phosphorylation cascade. MAP kinase pathway is a specific phosphorylation cascade. Now check this out. I start out with this interaction. Activated relay molecule interacts with MAP kinase. That's a specific kinase. That kinase becomes active. Do you know what it phosphorylates? It phosphorylates this next kinase that's called MAP kinase kinase. So MAP kinase phosphorylates MAP kinase kinase, which phosphorylates MAP kinase kinase kinase, which phosphorylates MAP kinase 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 kinase. And then we have a cellular response. And so that would be a very specific individual proteins called MAP kinases that cause this phosphorylation testing. So what's the cellular response? It could be upper down regulation of the protein, it could be upper down regulation of an enzyme, it could be a change in a metabolic uh, pathway producing a new metabolic product, there's all sorts of things that can happen. And when you start to get into additional courses, especially places like endocrinology and cell biology, you begin to deal with these cell signaling pathways in a very specific, uh, a very specific term, very specific terms. So you need to add in the names of the first that are involved in the actual response that's occurring. All right. So on our phosphorylation cascade, the inorganic phosphate from an ATP molecule is going to be used to activate, or it's going to be used in that activation process. So I spend ATP to liberate that 
uh, phosphate to attach it to an inactive protein kinase so that inactive protein kinase becomes an active protein kinase. What about if I want to turn the pathway off? If I want to turn the pathway off, it would be nice if I could turn the pathway off. Well, how, how might I be able to, to turn this active protein kinase off? Okay, there's an easier way. The kinase adds a phosphate. What if I had an enzyme that removed the phosphate? All right, and then it's simply turning the switch on, turning the switch on, turning the switch on, turning the switch on. So what I'm going to have to reverse the process of the phosphorylation cascade. To reverse the effect, I'm going to have another enzyme that's called a phosphatase. Kinases always add phosphate. Phosphatases remove phosphate. Protein phosphatase removes the inorganic phosphate, which is what you see happening here. That PPP will stand for protein phosphatases. Okay. So we're ripping the phosphate off to move that to our inactive protein kinase form. That inactive. That inactive. A second signaling system is called the cyclic AMP second messenger system. And here's a picture of the cyclic AMP second messenger system. So I got my membrane, and in my membrane I have bound up a receptor, and I have bound up this enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. By the way, how, how do I know that it's an enzyme? It's ASE. I also have this peripheral protein, which is called the G protein. And the G just simply responds to the fact that it utilizes this energy analog called GTP, guanamine triphosphate. So it's not ATP, but it's very similar and equivalent to ATP. So my first messenger, my ligand, my signal molecule, and they're saying such as epinephrine, that single signal molecule binds to the receptor. So I have the ligand binding to the receptor. What happens when I bind a receptor that's a protein? Bind the protein. No. I want to go back to your original answer. You already told me. Change its function. So we're going to change the shape or we're going to change the function. We're going to change the shape and the function of the receptor. When we change the shape and the function of a second cyclic AMP second messenger receptor protein, it causes the G protein to hydrolyze GTP. That makes the G protein active and it scoots across the membrane over to adenylyl cyclase. And it takes adenylyl cyclase and it turns it off. It creates, it's a relay molecule that turns on adenylyl cyclase. When adenylyl cyclase is turned on, we're going to take this molecule called adenylyl and we're going to cyclize it. Adenylyl, our adenylyl molecules include things like ATP. So we're going to take ATP and we're going to cyclize it. What does it mean to cyclize something? If it was straight and I cyclize through a cyclase, it turns it into a circle. Now, the way that this works, ATP, if I remove two of the phosphates, I end up with what type of molecule? A MP. I go from triphosphate to monophosphate. AMP, when it gets exposed to a watery environment, such as what we find in the cell, automatically wants to go into a cyclical shape. So adenylyl cyclase gets turned on, and we take ATP, strip off two of the phosphates, and we create this molecule called cyclic AMP, C-A-M-P. Cyclic AMP is a second messenger. 
It takes the signal of the first messenger and passes it onto this molecule called protein kinase A. The protein kinase A is a very specific protein kinase. That's actually a protein kinase, not, pro not like the, the protein kinase 1, which is really just a general name for specific protein kinases. Protein kinase A is a specific protein kinase. So what does that protein kinase do when it's activated it's in the presence of cyclic canopy? It's a kinase, right? So it's going to phosphorylate. So that protein kinase phosphorylates another protein, turns that protein on, and into that protein is the middle of an enzymatic pathway and increased product density. And now we change the physiology of the cell completely. Last system here that I'm going to tell you about is the calcium second messenger system. And really, there's going to be two molecules that you need to know about here that if they show up, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that is a calcium second messenger system. The two molecules are going to be phospholipase C and protein kinase C. Okay? So if you see phospholipase C or protein kinase C, instantly think calcium. So this is our calcium second messenger system. So the way that this is going to work, we have another receptor. And that receptor is going to bind to a ligand, such as a hormone. If I bind a receptor that is a protein, if I bind that to something, what's going to happen to that protein? Change in shape, change its function. The change in shape and function leads to another G protein to be activated. And then that relay molecule in the active form carrying the GTP goes over to its effector, which is this enzyme called phospholipase C. Now, phospholipase C. Do you think you could parse the name of that enzyme and tell me what it maybe does? So what is a what is a lipid? I mean, basically, it's a fat. So this lipase is probably going to act on a lipid. But it's not just a lipid. It's a phospholipid. So what is that lipid going to have attached to? Phospho. What do you say? It's going to have a phosphate. It's going to be a phosphorylated lipid. And it's a lipase, and so it's going to break that lipid apart. There happens to be a lipid in here that's phosphorylated. It's called PIP2. Phospho inositol phosphate. Say that four times fast. Just call it PIP2. So PIP2 has two components. It has this part down here that contains the phosphate, and then it has the other part here that's kind of stuck up inside of the membrane. So it's a lipid, but it's phosphorylated. The lipid part sticks in the membrane that phosphorylated is hydrophilic, hydrophobic rather, hydrophilic, I said it right the first time. It's hydrophilic, loves water, so it's inside of the intracellular fluid. The phospholipase is going to split those two molecules. So the phospholipase comes over here and it breaks the molecule apart. The PIP2 is broken apart. The membrane bound part of the uh, molecule is called DAG, diacylglycerol. That diacylglycerol or that DAG remains up inside of the membrane. The other part, the phosphorylated part, is basically the inositol phosphate. It becomes this molecule called inositol triphosphate or IP3. So we break PIP2 to form DAG and to form IP3. DAG goes over and interacts with protein kinase C. It's a protein kinase, so what is it going to do? What well, kinases always do? It's going to phosphorylate something. It's going to phosphorylate another protein. And that's going to lead towards a response in that target cell. The IP3 is the second messenger. IP3 goes over to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a storage site for calcium inside of the cell. And when IP3 interacts with the endoplasmic reticulum, it causes proteins in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum to make that 
endoplasmic reticulum permeable to calcium, so calcium releases into the cell. That calcium as levels increase inside of the cell interact with things like calmodulin, which is just a calcium uh, handling protein. That calmodulin responds by changing the, the, the response in the cell. Also, the calcium directly can affect the cellular response as well. Okay, clear as mud, right? What time is it exactly? 953? 950. Well, we ran out of time. Hormones like insulin work through these different pathways. So in insulin, just as you're packing up, insulin will bind to the insulin receptor. The insulin receptor phosphorylates itself. Acts as what's called tyrosine phosphor, uh, phosphorylase. Tyrosine phosphorylase phosphorylates itself. And this leads towards increased production of a protein called GLUT4. GLUT4 translocates to the cell membrane. And GLUT4 is glucose transporter 4. When GLUT4 is present in high concentrations in the membrane, it picks up glucose from the bloodstream and begins to internalize it in the cell, thereby reducing blood glucose levels. So insulin reduces blood glucose levels, and there's a bunch of microbiology between insulin and the reduction of glucose centered around receptors, particularly the second messenger system, the production of glucose. Okay? See you all on the bye. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Thank you.